Hi, everyone. I am Madhuri Karak. I want to welcome you back to the fourth edition of our series, Rare Conversations. And for those of you who've been with us from the very beginning, you know that this is the space where we speak with a range of experts who are expanding the fields of sustainability, conservation, environment, as we know it. And for those of you new, welcome. Today, we are with Lydie Klotz, Professor of Engineering Systems and the Environment at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. And Lydie's research is filling in important underexplored overlaps between engineering and behavioral science. And Professor Klotz's book, Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less, looks at how we, so that's you and I, might tap into this subtractive mindset to better solve ecological challenges. Welcome to Rare Conversations, Lady. So excited to have you here. Thanks, Madhuri. It's great to be here. This is like the highlight of my, uh, of my working summer. I've got to talk to a lot of people about the, about the book. Um, but if you had told me before I wrote it that this would be the only group I got to talk to, it would be, it would be worth it. So I hear on the grapevine and in 2021, that means social media, that your journey to engineering school had a bit of a detour via the soccer field. And I have two questions. What position did you play? And wait, like, what? I sense a very good story here. Tell us everything. <laughs> um, well, it's more like my, uh, my journey to soccer took a detour through engineering school, um, <laughs> if I'm being honest with my parents. So uh, yeah, I, um, I lived for soccer growing up. Um, and in the United States, at least, the soccer system is set up so you can be really serious about soccer and also go to college, which I think is a, a privilege here compared to the soccer system in some other countries. Um, and so I picked my college based on what was the best soccer team <laughs> that I could start on right away and play all four years. And uh, you asked what position I played. Also, I, I only wanted to play positions where I could try to score goals. Um, and so that, that was the other filter that I ran my college selection criteria through. Um, that being said, I always, uh, you know, we've got a lot of engineers in my family. Um, and I think the, the advice that I received all the way through, which turned out to be amazing advice for me was that, you know, um, you might as well do engineering because you can basically do anything from there. It doesn't cut off any of your options. And so that was, I, I picked this college, Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, I had good engineering program, uh, but also I could start right away in soccer turned out to be a great fit. I got to, to learn engineering, play soccer. Um, and then after I, I played professional soccer after, um, after college for a couple of years, uh, I was only, I made like $2,000 a month. So uh, not, a, not like Lionel Messi. Um, and I, I had to still think about what I wanted to do after I was done playing soccer. So the combination of not really a, a long-term future in it, plus just, you know, thinking about, okay, how do I want to have an impact for the rest of my life. That's when I worked for a little while and then went back to graduate school where I kind of merged the interest in um, engineering with sustainability. So how do we engineer in a more sustainable way? And as my careers evolved, um, I'm, I think I've kept that engineering mindset in the sense that it's like, hey, we're trying to apply science creatively to solve problems. And that's something that historically engineers have done with physics and chemistry and sciences like that. But I also think it's a very engineering way of thinking, you know, the work that Rare does and the work that I'm trying to do now, which is like thinking about human behavior and our judgment and decision making and, you know, social norms and how we can, you know, creatively apply those to solve environmental challenges. So that's how I got from, you know, only caring about picking a college based on where I could, where I could start right away to um, kind of having, I think, the same um, motivation and hopefully a similar impact to what the what the folks at Rare are doing. I can't help but note that your parents sound like Indian parents. <laughs> Keep your options open. 
<laughs> yeah, they were good. They, uh, yeah, they did a good job of, uh, you know, kind of saying, hey, you can, you can do whatever you want. But it was, you know, it's pretty clear that um, I, I don't know, I, coming from a position of privilege, like I did, where you've got parents who can think about like your education and things like that, they eventually wanted me to think about how I could make a positive impact in the world, which of course you can do through soccer, but you have to be better than I was. <laughs> Before we dive into your book, we have a quiz for all of you listeners and viewers tuning in, and we'll soon find out if you're better than Lydie's undergraduate students at UVA. So with no comment, we present a puzzle and just look at it for a couple of seconds and then Steph's going to give you a poll with uh, five options and we'll see how you do. Just saw a comment here. The poll is going to pop up in a second. So you should uh, be able to see the questions now. And I would say over the next 10, 12 seconds, we'll close the poll. Can you see the questions now? Okay. Okay, I see some answers coming in. Nice and strong. I wonder if there's herd mentality going on here, even though you can't see each other's responses, but hmm. Okay, last 10 seconds. This is really cool. Some of you are sharing alternative answers to the puzzle in the chat. All right, Steph, I think we can end the poll now and we'll keep the results under wraps for just a little bit and you'll see why. But Lydie, why don't you start telling us about the book I know our brains are wired to add, right? To layer when we're problem solving, but subtracting, reducing, taking away, that's an approach that the human brain is less inclined to take when encountering problems. So what drew your attention to subtracting? What was your eureka moment, so to speak? Yeah, the closest thing to a eureka moment, I was playing Legos with my uh, son Ezra, who was three at the time, and uh, he's six now. But uh, this was basically what we were doing. If you see here, it's uh, we were building a bridge and um, it wasn't level. So I thought that the, pro the solution to this problem was to add a block to the shorter column. But before I could do that, uh, my three-year-old decided to take a block away from the longer column. And um, you know, as a engineer, designer, somebody who thinks about sustainability, I'd always been interested in kind of minimalist designs or these things that look like less is more. But what, what Ezra's bridge really did for me was kind of 
hone in on the specific thought process and action that needs to happen, right? And so subtracting is the act of taking that block away. It's not the end state of the shorter bridge or, or anything like that. And that that act and the thought process that, that led to it turned out to be what I was interested in and kind of the genesis of the, the book and our research. And, you know, the bridge was also really useful as kind of the first version. We just had everybody do the, the grid studies, but the bridge was the first version of that kind of study. And I would take it around, give it to unsuspecting students who would come to meet with me to ask about advice on classes and things. And I'm making them do this bridge study and everybody was adding like I did. Um, and then I also brought it to my friend and co-author on the, the paper that eventually resulted from our research, Gabe Adams. And I had been talking to her all along about like design for sustainability and hey, why don't we you know, take away more or so I thought I had been saying that. And when I gave her the bridge, she added like everyone else, which kind of surprised me because Gabe's a genius and because I thought I had primed her the same way I, we had kind of primed this audience with, you know, talking about what I thought was subtraction. But but she added it um, and and it, she immediately said, oh, oh, that's what you're talking about. That's a great idea to do research on. It's like, why don't we subtract as a way to make things better? Um, and we since studied it, uh, definitely over 10,000 hours worth of research that's gone into it between me and the, the three co-authors um, and all kinds of paradigms, not just Legos, um, not just the grids that you just saw also travel itineraries and basically across ideas, objects, and situations. And what we found is the punchline that you kind of hit on really well, Mattery, is that um, when we think, how do we change something or how do we make something better? Our first instinct is to think, hey, what can I add to this idea, object, situation? Um, and that's not necessarily a problem, right? I mean, adding is a fine option too, but, but what happens is we think, hey, what can I add? And then we think that the problem is solved and we move on and never even consider the act of, of taking away. And so that's a really powerful and new research finding. It was on the cover of Nature Magazine in April, which is like the pinnacle of my academic career is probably all downhill from here. Um, and that also serves as kind of the launching off point for the book, um, because this, this idea that we systematically overlook subtraction as a way to make things better is really problematic. And then the book delves into some of the ways that we can get better at not overlooking it. But then also, there's a whole lot of issues with subtracting, even after you do think of it, right? I mean, you may think of this as an option, but there are some very um, very real barriers in the real world to to taking away to to actually choosing it. So that's the you know the book starts with Ezra's Legos and um, and kind of goes from there. So you know Daniel Kahneman has this great quote right, and for those of you unfamiliar with the name, Kahneman is considered to be the founding father of behavioral economics. He won the Nobel Prize for his work on human decision making. And the quote I had in mind was, and in fact, he's citing another applied psychologist for Kurt Lewin. And I'm going to read this because it's a famous person's quote. So let's not mangle anything. He says, Lewin's insight was that if you want to achieve change in behavior, there's a good way to do it and a bad way to do it. The good way to do it is by reducing the restraining forces, not by increasing the driving forces. So it seems to me that good behavioral science has always been interested in how we can remove societal and individual barriers to action, right? And so is this also where Subtract is drawing some of its inspiration? Yeah, I would, um, it would, first of all, this is just the perfect next question to ask after the basic insight, because this is getting right at the, the work that Rare does and organizations like Rare do. Um, but yeah, after my three-year-old, I would say Kurt Lewin is a close second in terms of inspiring my research. And there's a, a little history lesson on, on Lewin. He's a really fascinating person. And he's, um, you 
Kahneman, rightfully so, considered the father of behavioral economics as we know it. And that, but Lewin is the father of social psychology. And Lewin was this, he was born in Poland, had to migrate to Germany, then had to come to the United States because of, you know, Hitler's rising power in Germany. So he's this person who's always interested in using science to address social issues. And he became a very eminent scientist, but his main interest in a lot of his research methods were very applied. He was, he was trying to use science to change social systems and his insights, his core scientific insights arose from that effort to try to change these systems. So in a lot of ways, he was doing similar work to Rare, like kind of starting with the problem and then you know adapting the science accordingly or deriving the science from it. Um, in one of, you know, the, the mindset shifts that Lewin and others helped bring about was, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about a, a system with people in it, that you do need to understand the people and what's going on in their head. But a lot of what's going on has nothing to do with the, the individuals. It has to do with the, the forces that they're exposed to, right? Like what else is going on in the system that's causing people to, to act in this way? Um, and, you know, I know that, that rare... Rare uses this, um, considers this. I mean, uh, Eric Thulin's TEDx talk um, talks about, you know, cooperative behavior adoption. And uh, so that basically cooperative behavior, you're, um, you're, okay, I see that my video is lost. So as long as you can hear me, I will, uh, let me try to replug that in. Lighty, I think you're okay. It was user error on my fault. Okay, good. All right, I'm back. Um, so, you know, and what Rare does is think about not just like individual behavior, <laughs> but how does, you know, kind of behavior percolate, right? And how do, you know, individual behaviors become group behaviors and how do group norms, you know, influence individual behaviors. So in Lewin's terms, those are forces, right? So the they're forces that are acting on the system. Um, and the point that Kahneman's making about Lewin's work is this reminder that, you know, the better option is to subtract these forces. Of course, we can add forces that are kind of moving in the direction that you want it to be. Um, but before we do that, <laughs> we should think about what forces in the system are already kind of pushing us in the wrong direction and how we can take those away. And I think the, you know, so the insight to subtract isn't new, but um, the fact that we systematically overlook subtraction does kind of explain why we need somebody like Kurt Lewin to, to remind us that it's an option. And then Daniel Kahneman, 50 years later, is still reminding people, hey, subtracting barriers is the good way to make change. Um, I've got uh, another example from Ezra that kind of illustrates this, you know, this notion of subtracting barriers for those of you who aren't practicing it already every day in your work. But um, one of the problems we have with him now, you know, problems is a bad way to put it. One of the challenges we face with our, he's now six, he comes home from school and he wants to watch the iPad, right? He's tired, he just wants to chill out, sit back, relax. And so he comes in, he sees the iPad, he's like, oh, I wanna watch that. And then it becomes a debate and a negotiation between he and I about, you know, hey, iPads aren't the best thing, you know, too much screen time makes you, makes your brain get lazy. Um, and, and then I might offer an incentive. I might say, oh, well, if you don't watch the iPad, then you can have a, a cookie for dessert for, from dinner. And that's you know trying to move him in the direction of the behavior that I want. It's giving him an incentive. But the, the reason that Lewin said that removing is a barrier is, is, is the better option is because adding that incentive just increases tension in the system. It does make Ezra more likely to say, okay, I'm not gonna watch the iPad because he's got that cookie incentive. But if he doesn't resist, if he does still watch the iPad, now he's mad because he's watching the iPad and he's missing out on the cookie. So it's increased tension in the system. Whereas if, you know, one of the things that I try that's kind of removing the barrier is um, just putting the iPad out of sight and out of mind and like distracting him a little when he comes in the door. And then you've kind of removed that, um, remove that obstacle to the behavior that you want. And it also relieves the tension in the system. I looked at uh, uh, the last thing I'll say, I, one of the things you, you've worked on, Madhuri, is uh, an example of subtracting um, the, the work in um, 
where you're doing the work in, is it Colombia with the onion farmers? Exactly, in Valle del Cauca, one of the municipalities in uh, Colombia. Yeah, and it's so like, I, this is one of the problems with doing all these talks after I've written the book is I would totally would have used that in the book because it's a beautiful example of the, the difficulty in subtracting ideas um, and the power of subtracting ideas. So if you read the, it's in the, published in Stanford Social Innovation Review, um, and you know one of the, the subtitle is what you know no longer work. So basically as climate changes, this intergenerational knowledge that has been passed down about how to farm sustainably is no longer effective because the climate has changed. Um, and so what that requires is a really hard thing is for people to no longer rely on the, these ideas that, in their, that are in their head and, and it's hard to subtract them. And the, and the article talks about some of the ways that you might do that, but that's a beautiful example of subtracting, also a beautiful example of the power in removing barriers because the barrier to the behavior you want there is not actually a lack of incentives. It's the fact that there's this knowledge passed down that used to work and no longer does. I was also reflecting on how some of the figures we are in dialogue with are Ezra Klotz, Daniel Kahneman, Kurt Lewin, pretty great crowd. It's, um, uh, Ezra's, um, it's amazing, like he's six now, so he's old enough to understand and like I'll tell him when he comes home today, hey, I was talking to this group rare and they do some really cool work where they like work on conservation of oceans and there's people from all over the world who are listening about your bridge example and he'll be like, yep, I'm, I'm teaching people how to subtract. So he's, he's very proud of it. <laughs> Let's take some of those insights even more explicitly to the environmental field, right? Because from where I'm sitting, I'd say that, you know, environmental change makers are especially likely to add in their change making efforts, right? So legislating more laws, better laws, but more laws, um, buying more environment friendly things, right? Like let's get composting bins, um, let's initiate more awareness campaigns. So, how do you think we as practitioners, researchers, the ordinary person on the street, how do we do less for more change? Right, um, and I, I'll share my best thoughts on this, but I'm really looking forward to learning from this group too. Um, and it, it's key here to point out that this isn't just a matter of not thinking of it. So even once you think of subtracting, it, it can be hard to do. And one of the reasons it's hard to do is because adding shows competence, right? And so this example of adding the recycling bin, if you're a environmental organization that's promising to, to help somebody out and you know they, they're kind of measuring your uh, your effectiveness, if you've got this recycling bin sitting there, it's like, okay, look, they did this. Um, whereas if you take away a barrier, the thing you did is now invisible and, you know, it might be harder to justify or to, to display your competence. It's not a, it's not an excuse, right? I mean, we still need to think of subtraction and it still can be more powerful, but I'm just acknowledging that I, I realize that there are more issues here than just not thinking of it. Um, so, so the way I think about this in terms of environmental issues, I kind of go from the individual level all the way to the you know systemic societal level, and then the um, and then the, the philosophical level even. Um, and maybe I can I'll talk about the individual level, Madri. I'll let you chime in, and then uh, go to the other two levels. But the uh, you know at the individual level. It's, you know, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, whatever waste mar management paradigm we use, um, those are systematically overlooking the subtractive option, right? And, and there's a lot of evidence actually that the three R's are something that we kind of internalize and use for all kinds of sustainability issues. So reduce is the first thing we should do, remove or reduce, reuse the second and recycle the third. And all, all those are great, but um, none of them are subtracting. The closest is reduce, which basically means add more slowly. And so what about removing? Um, and if you translate that waste management paradigm to CO2 in the atmosphere, for example, I mean, it becomes really clear that 
removal needs to be part of our um, part of our decision making process, and it and it increasingly is becoming part of the process. But for a long time, I mean, we've kind of known about this CO two in the atmosphere issue and been ma mainly working on the you know reduce reuse um, kind of paradigm. So at just at the very individual level, it's like overlooking subtraction in these environmental issues is I think probably the the most consequential way that we did it. We're 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 overlooking it because so many of these environmental issues, the the challenge is that we've kind of overshot systemic limits. And when you've overshot limits, you you know, by definition, need to subtract. How does that sound to you, Madhuri? Yeah, I was also curious about, you know, the sort of research that you've done in trials and so on and so forth in terms of the feelings generated in individuals when they take away, because, you know, when you get something, there is that gratification, there is this sense of purpose that, you know, you've moved ahead somehow, you've taken an action. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, in terms of behavioral strategy, at least, if there's a way to also think about the emotional charge of subtracting mm -hmm. what does that look like for you in the um the lab yeah i mean there's a couple of ways so um right and this ties into kahneman's work right showing that people view losses you're more emotionally you know devastated by a, a loss than they are kind of happy because of a gain um where it doesn't fit into our work is that you know the things we're talking about here are are positives, they're improvements. Um, so when you, you know, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's the goal here, right? And so we're, we're achieving our goal. We haven't lost anything. It, it is easy to kind of perceive a subtraction as a loss. And, you know, hopefully like the book and just this talk can kind of help people get around that obstacle for themselves. But I, I also think that when you're when you're sharing what you've done with other people, it's pretty easy to just kind of invert the subtraction, right? So instead of calling it less CO2, call it more, you know, more <laughs> higher percentage of oxygen or whatever uh, it becomes. Um, so like kind of just frame the, the positive side of it so that people aren't, you know, falling into this trap of loss aversion, even though it isn't in fact a loss. Um, and that can get you around kind of these, these emotional, um, emotional ties. Um, the other way to think about that is um, sure you are losing something in a lot of these cases, but what you're really focused on is the end state, which is the, you know, the stable bridge or the, you know, environment with less CO2 in it. And so if you can really help people stay focused on that end state, then, you know, the thing that's lost isn't the single Lego block. The thing that's lost is a stable bridge. And then, you know, loss aversion is kind of working in your direction instead of against it. But that's a great question. It allows me to, you know, distinguish between this other very um, powerful force and, um, and show how it relates to this kind of neglect of subtraction. Yeah, I like the focus on the stable bridge. I can, yeah. I can, I can take that as a motto. Yes. Um, so what Kondo. does the stable bridge look like, uh, you know, societally? But I also cut you off. What yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say it's. Uh, I should give, since we are citing Lewin, Kahneman, Ezra, I should cite Marie Kondo there, where um, <laughs> she she does it's, a really good. Proud. <laughs> she has us declutter, right? Um, and but she doesn't say, you know, she diverts focus away from the stuff you're taking away from your life and focuses on this end state of a tidy living space, and then that becomes the thing that you're losing if you don't do what she says. So um, anyway. It's uh, and I think it's one of the reasons that her her work resonates. She also does a really good job with kind of avoiding this loss, right? Her whole thing is spark joy. Um, and so she totally flips this around and thinks um, and thinks and has people think about, OK, you know, what is not sparking joy? Get rid of that from your life. And then you're focused on the joyful parts of of subtracting. Um, yeah, and, and I was just going to ask you, so the stable bridge, the joy, what does that look like, you know, at the sort of collective level, um, if we are to, you know, pursue that 
subtractive mindset? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the subtraction, like, I don't, there's nothing wrong with adding, right? I mean, but the, you know, people are already thinking about that. And so for the work that Rare does, for example, and, you know, for the work that I'm doing, you know, I, I think that I'm contributing or hope trying to contribute to a more sustainable future. I think of this stable bridge as a, a system that humans can adapt to, right? So that we've slowed down, so that it's not not changing at such a fast rate that humans can no longer adapt to it. And I think to to create that or to do our best job at creating that, we need to think of ways to add to change the system, and we need to think of ways to subtract to change the system. I mean, like that's the um, yeah st stable, sustainable climate in the comments there. But the um, you know, if you think about the Anthropocene, the definition of the Anthropocene, this era that we're living in is that humans have become the dominant influence on the system that supports all life, including human life. Um, and, you know, to think about we're the dominant influence. So our activities are going to change that system or are changing that system. And as we do that unintentionally and intentionally, we need to be bringing all of our options to bear on that, on that massive system that, um, is more important than Ezra's bridge. Lighty, I am getting a lot of really great questions in the chat. Okay. Think about pivoting to some questions from the audience and see what folks have uh, in store. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So the first one I have in front of me is, does carbon capture technology qualify as removal? Yeah, I saw that one come up. So perfect, because that was one of the things I wanted to touch on. Certainly, yeah, carbon capture technology, you're, you're removing carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and I think that's a perfect example of a, a subtractive way to kind of solve this problem. It also illustrates um, one of the, the neat, I think in the history of like environmental thought, um, there's been this kind of tension between the techno optimist types um, who are creating carbon capture and storage, for example, and the kind of conservationist types who are like, okay, the problem here is that we're exceeding planetary limits. We need to scale back our operations. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, both of these are very well-meaning groups. They're trying to solve this massive problem with, with an approach. And one of the things that throughout history has happened is that the approach, there hasn't been like kind of a unifying thing for these two groups um, because the techno-optimists are thinking about, okay, well, you know, don't worry about these limits. We can, um, we'll figure out some technology that helps with them. But, you know, the carbon capture and storage is an example of how subtracting can kind of bridge between these two groups, right? So it's a very techno- optimistic solution. Um, and if you're a conservationist who's, you know, very focused on like, how do we kind of scale back what we're doing? How do we avoid these planetary limits? It's also kind of meeting your goals. Um, maybe not, uh, maybe not as, as well as some other ways, but it's definitely kind of meeting both of those groups goals. And this is something that's been, you know, talked about from you know, Dr. Seuss, who I use in my book, to John McPhee, who's another great um, environmental writer, to, to Charles Mann, who talks about um, wizards and prophets as these two dueling visions. So yes, carbon capture and storage subtracts. The thing I would add, though, is in my view, we haven't paid nearly enough attention to that over the last 50 years about ways to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. The mindset has always been, okay, how do we how do we stem the flow of CO2 into the atmosphere? And now we're finally realizing since we're at 415 or whatever parts per million and we should be at 350, it's like, oh, well, geez, subtracting needs to be part of this. And I think if we had if we had been working seriously on it for for a really long time, we might be in a better spot than we are now. We have a really good one next, and I'm going to combine two questions here. So the first part is, why are our brains wired for adding rather than subtracting? And how can we train ourselves to subtract? And then the second part is, how can one become a successful advocate for subtraction in the field of conservation? Terrific. Um, 
and I, this sounds like I'm plugging the book, but I mean, I really, the whole first half of the book kind of talks about why this is happening. I'll give some of the highlights here. Um, and also by knowing the why that kind of leads into, as you'll see how we can train ourselves to do better. And I think it is true that we can, in this case, train ourselves to do better. I don't think that's the case with all biases, but this one, there's some evidence that we can. And so, you know, why, again, the fundamental issue is that we, you know, when we, think about ways to solve problems or when we do searches in our brain for possible solutions to things, we do that in an ordered manner. And so adding is coming up first. Um, now there are a lot of, you know, biological reasons that could part could partially explain this. This is, you know, less our specific research and more kind of theory from other research, but, um, you know, we're wired to acquire, right? So <laughs> acquiring calories, stockpiling food, those are behaviors that have been, that have helped us pass down our genes, us and every other living thing. Um, also this, this desire to display competence to show that we're having an impact on the world is actually a very biological thing. So, you know, the famous example of bowerbirds building their ceremonial nests. Um, so bowerbirds, they build, the male bowerbirds build these ceremonial nests. The female bowerbirds come around to look at the nest, decide who to mate with based on how much they like the nest. And then the female bowerbirds go and build a nest that actually shelters the young. Um, and so the whole point of these ceremonial nests is to show that the male bowerbird can in fact have an impact on their world. And um, you know, to the extent that it's easier to show impact by adding physical stuff, that is an example of um, how adding could be kind of a biological or evolutionary advantage. Um, some other theories that I think there's a lot to is, you know, adding's been really good, right? I mean, if you're roaming around on the on the plains with no city and no civilization and no shelter and no like permanent source of food, thinking about adding those things has been an, a, a good thing. And so for a lot of human history, we've been surrounded by a world that can mostly be improved by adding stuff, but now we have these physical things, you know, the cities, but also the the social systems, right? The the social systems, the the legal systems. We haven't talked yet about, you know, the the amount of regulations that have gotten to the point where, hey, taking away is also a good approach to kind of addressing environmental issues. So for a long time, we've been surrounded by a world where adding was really the kind of maybe the dominant way to make things better, and so repeated exposure to that would potentially make us kind of more likely to rely on that heuristic of, okay, we're gonna add first and then just move on. Um, so those are some of the, the reasons why this could be the case. And then, you know, to, to train ourselves to do better, the most useful thing I think is, you know, setting up cues. And that's why the, the three R's is so damaging because this is like this, this environmental cue that we use. It's a shortcut we use and we're going to make these decisions and it reminds us to think about reducing, reusing and recycling and we overlook subtracting. And when we gave people cues in our experiments, so we give them that grid experiment, for example, and we give one group a cue, just say, hey, you can add or you can subtract, right? And that increased rates of subtraction, which, okay, big deal. Of course, a reminder is gonna increase rates of something, but it didn't increase the rates of, of adding. So what that shows is that we're already thinking about adding and the, the reminder to subtract kind of increased our rates of doing so. Um, the downside is that we didn't, we never found any evidence in our studies that like a reminder to subtract on the grids, for example, would like carry over to Legos. Um, so what needs to happen with the cues is you need to, I think, remind yourself close to when you're making the decision. And I think when, when you know your processes and you know the key decisions that you're making, it's easy to kind of put in place those reminders. So this is a, a personal one for me, um, and it's not related to environmental issues, but when I'm making my to-do list for the week, I force myself to also write stop doings, which are things that I'm no longer going to um, do that are already on my, my schedule. So that's a cue that reminds me to subtract, makes it makes me less likely to fall prey to this this you know tendency to not even not even think about it. Um, the other things that help, in addition to cues, are um, kind of giving yourself more time to think. And this is uh, especially relevant to your world and the to your work in you know places where there's economic poverty. Um, 
because one of the things that we found is that the more cognitively burdened people were, the more likely they are to default to this kind of automated mode of doing things, right? So the more stuff you're thinking about, the more likely you are to go with your first instinct and add the block to the to the bridge. And if you have more time to think, like a lot of you did when you're doing this problem and you're you know tuned in for a conference and you don't have other stuff going on, you can be more likely to to think to take away. Um, the challenge there, of course, is that you know this tendency to add in the in our ideas and in our in our like social media is working directly against something that would actually help us subtract so we're we're more likely to to add information which makes us more cognitively loaded which makes us less likely to subtract which makes us more likely to add information and so on so those are those are a couple of the best um, best examples but it's a great question i think this is actually a great segue to our next question lady how do we shift that dominant narrative of adding, right? How do we um, kind of push back? And the question is, is subtracting in your research similar to shifting norms and behaviors, or is that a case of two complementary solutions? I think you're well poised to answer that now. Yeah, what a high level question. Simple and high level, I love it. Um, so, yeah, I think yes and yes to those questions. Um, the, but the social norm is less, you know, a social norm towards adding and more towards this thinking of adding and subtracting as uh, in opposition. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, so in, in chapter three of the book, I talk about like cultural reasons for this behavior. And one of the things that I looked into is like, okay, independent thought versus interdependent thought, which loosely aligns with kind of like Eastern and Western ways of, of looking at the world. So the more inter independent thinking is like, you know, self-deterministic, you know, I, I'm in control of my own des destiny. Um, the interdependent is kind of the yin and yang view of the world. Everything returns to the the same spot. Um, and the, the one of the problems or one of the kind of traits of independent thinking and, and one of the things that's been really helpful um, for scientific reasoning and for scientific progress is positioning things, positioning concepts as opposites or as in opposition to each other, right? So if you can say, if X is true, then Y is not true, then that helps you kind of reason logically. And it, it's super helpful, except for when the concepts aren't actually in opposition. And so if we have this tendency to think of add or subtract, like you can only do one or the other, which, um, you know, I have that tendency, certainly, that was one of the last passes through the book was to make sure I wasn't representing these things as in opposition. Because in fact, they're like, they're complementary approaches to making change. So if you add to something and it makes it better, why doesn't that make you think, oh, geez, I, I should think about subtracting. I should, I should see if subtracting also makes this situation better. And so, so the social norm slash mindset, I think that would be the most helpful would be to think about, um, would be to think about how do you, um, how do you shift from this add and subtract mindset or add or subtract mindset to an add and subtract mindset. And then this problem where, okay, I think about adding first, it's not really a problem because then it brings um, subtracting to mind too. But that's, you know, I think that's a, the highest level overview answer I can give to that question. I'm sure there's other kind of nuanced ways to address it. And I think it's a really important question because it, it gets at the fundamental thing here, which is like, how do we bring these two basic options to bear on these huge problems that we're, we're facing? Yeah, just listening to you speak, I was thinking maybe your next book can be about how to defeat binary thinking, which seems to be you know the bane of human existence um it's hard i wonder yeah there must be a good book out there on that but um if not i'm it's i'm writing i'm made a mental note if, if no one's written it i'm considering it <laughs> i don't know how to do it though yeah exactly and it really i think you illustrated that so well right now that it doesn't have to be don't ever add but that also consider subtract 
just as you would consider adding. Um, we have uh, an anecdote coming in the chat and I'll just read it out and share it with the rest of our listeners. I've enriched my life through reduction because it opened up new possibilities. It made me appreciate certain things more and it simplified much, which gave me so much more freedom. But I think one needs to experience this to know how positive subtraction is. That's very evocative you put. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I mean, I think, uh, and it's hard, um, but I, I, I think, uh, I'll just give a personal example. Um, so one, I mentioned my stop doings, another like really kind of simple productivity thing that I stopped was, or subtractive thing that I did was not check emails as much. So I, I challenged myself, okay, I'm just gonna check once in the morning and once at night. And okay, I did this really straightforward subtraction. It doesn't seem like much, but well, then what started to happen was I started, you know, I had my free time and free brain space, but then I started getting less emails because so many of the emails I was getting were responses, you know, to things that I had sent out where I'd send like something to 10 graduate students. And of course they're going to then respond, which means that I have 10 extra emails the next day. And so I think that the, it can spill over, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, and, you know, if you can take these initial subtractive steps um, and then it can show you that it is in fact positive and then you can keep going. I'll also say that, you know, that's a really beautiful example of a concept that I talk about in the book, which is noticeable less. So we've talked about how it's hard to show competence through taking away, but it's not impossible. Like if you go into a house that the person has just read Marie Kondo's book, you can tell that the house is clean from the subtracting, right? And so the more you take away, the more likely that you can notice the, the competence from taking away, um, which kind of helps with that, um, helps with that human desire to show competence. So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really great observation that you, know, you need to kind of experience it um, in whatever form to realize that it's better. I have a, an organizational question very quickly. So, you know, when organizations are under a lot of pressure to make the most quote unquote impact, how can groups measure the impact of the subtraction? Yeah, that's, I mean, the thing that jumps immediately to mind is, um, you know, focusing on that what's the improvement you're after, right? Um, because if the improvement is not the, if the improvement is the number of recycling bins that you've added, then you've got no chance with subtraction. But if improvement, if you're measuring it, you know, in terms of, hey, what we really wanna improve is the waste management practices of this community that we're working with, then it's really, it's easier to show that um, subtraction is, is possible or, so show that subtraction is, you know, worth the worth whoever's time and, or, and investment that, you know, kind of paid you to help them. Um, I'll also say that this is where kind of numbers can help too, right? Because a lot of times subtraction is is physically invisible. So you do need to be able to, to remind people that, hey, in fact, you did this thing. And I, I'll think about that in terms of like, I use a lot of visible examples in the book, just partly because of my background in engineering and partly because they're they're visible and tangible, but like um, I start the book with the Embarcadero Freeway in San Francisco, which is a double-decker freeway that, that covered the waterfront. And, you know, it was taken away in 1990. And now the, that waterfront is like one of the most visited destinations in the world. And I went there, you know, in the midst of writing this book about <laughs> subtraction. And I had no idea. I knew that there had been a freeway removed in San Francisco, but I had no idea when I was walking along that waterfront with my son getting balloons tied for him looking at the harbor seals that this was the place that the freeway had been subtracted from so in a case like that i mean you can you know help pass down the history help you know maybe put signs up or some way to make you know recognize that the less is going to be invisible and figure out a way to kind of make it more more visible and more noticeable to people so that they think of subtraction more in the future and also so that they recognize what it is that you've done there I have a story again that's come in and I think the engineer and you will appreciate it. 
<laughs> so the story is a truck got stuck going under a bridge. The adults gather around proposing various additive solutions, right? So pushing the truck through, raising the bridge. And then a boy on a bike passing by says, why don't you just let some of the air out of the tires? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, um, and it's, uh, it's I, to me, that's the exact same kind of thinking thing going on there, right? You're just like going to the shortcut and you're trying to improve the situation and your mind goes right to the adding examples. I will say, I mean, it's so fun to have kids thinking of things that adults don't, but we don't have any evidence that kids are better at doing this than grownups. I mean, that's like a direction for our next direction for our research is to test that. And I will say firsthand experience so that Ezra's head doesn't get too big is that he's like just as bad as at subtracting as as the rest of us. And he just plays a ton of Legos. And this was the one instance where he he happened upon that answer. So one final thing before we wrap up. I know, Lady, you're joining us for BE Hive this fall. For those of you here, do check out the BE Hive page on rare.org. And you're on a panel with Brent Suter, who's the star pitcher for the baseball team, Milwaukee Brewers. I think Dee Kafari, who's a star sailor. So are you going in as ex-soccer player or engineering prof or what's what's your shtick going to be on that plano all right well i'll tell you all a secret so when you're doing this interdisciplinary stuff or when you have like multiple identities to bring like when i'm talking to behavioral scientists i i highlight my engineering credential when i'm talking to engineers i focus on the behavioral science and so when i'm on that panel with like these top-notch athletes i'm definitely going in as a as a professor so that I'm not having to compete with them. Because Dee and Brent, I mean, Dee has, uh, Brent's obviously, he, he makes more in one game than I did in my whole career. And then Brent, um, and then Dee, she sailed single-handedly nonstop around the world the wrong way, the first woman to do so. Um, and both of them have this like magnificent athletic career, but are also have developed a platform big enough where they can use their athletic platform to kind of advocate for some of the environmental issues that we touched on today. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, but I'm definitely going to be Professor Lighty Klotz there because that's not something that they have. So if you're intrigued by that description, and I have to admit I am a little bit, do check out the Beehive page and register. And thank you everyone for joining. I'd also like to invite you to support Rare's work to help us continue to inspire change so people and nature thrive. And please stay tuned for the next Rare Conversations. And that's going to be on October 14th. And we'll be chatting with anthropologist, Professor Roberta Katz from Stanford. And thank you again for joining us. And obviously you've conquered Zoom fatigue. You're still here 15 months into this trial that all our lives have become. And we so appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you, Lady, obviously, for this awesome conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all the great work you're doing.